breast cancer. Um, I was diagnosed with stage 3B breast cancer when I was 26 years old. And I just wanted to give my story. So maybe it's like a story time, I guess. But um, <clears throat> first let me paint paint the picture um, so maybe you could um, like step into my shoes and see you know just feel what I was feeling you know explain the situation surrounding it so it was uh, 2008 when something went wrong but to rewind a little bit at the end of 2007 um, I was going through a divorce with my second husband and um, I had to pack, you know, the whole apartment into storage. And I had no money because for, you know, that last year and a half, I was a stay-at-home mother. Um, and that's after being an accountant in the Marine Corps for five years. But I was a stay-at-home mother, so I had no income on my own. I had two um, children, a five-year-old and a two-year-old at the time that we separated. So um, so I was going through a divorce. We put, I lost the apartment because I didn't have money. I didn't have, you know, I couldn't pay rent. And everything was in storage. And I had to call my dad to send me some money. I had no money. And he sent me enough to put my tank on full. I had a car. The car was paid off, mind you. So all I could take with me was everything that could fit in my car. So I had my my two children back. I was in a vehicle and the only things that could fit was um, the majority of the stuff was my kids things, my kids clothes, my kids shoes, um, some of their toys. And so I didn't really have much room for anything of mine. Um, so I ended up putting all of my stuff in storage except for like two pairs of shoes and a few outfits. So I pull up to my dad's house and the tank was on E. I had just enough gas to get home. Like, that's crazy. I remember pulling in the driveway and the little light came on E and I'm like, whew. So um, my dad at the time didn't live in that house he was living in either Memphis or Atlanta at the time and so um, some of my siblings still did live in that house so I moved into that house so what my situation was is I was going through a divorce I had absolutely no money I had to move back home and then mind you my car was paid off my car got towed um, one of the neighbors didn't like it the way my car was parked, said it was obstruction of traffic, sheriff towed my car. I couldn't even begin to get my car back. I didn't have that kind of money. They wanted $300 off the rip to get my car. And so this was my situation. I had no money. I'm living at home. I was going through a divorce and I still had two children to support. And then February of 2008 I was 26 years old I remember I went to lay on the couch like this and I felt a knot under my arm and I was like that's not natural um, I'm, I, I know my body I know when something's off and something doesn't feel right that wasn't right and I was like okay this isn't good and um, so I like in the back of my head I said oh crap I have cancer because this was like a big knot it, it, it was it felt extremely uncomfortable when I would lay down so what I did because at the time I had no income I went ahead and got on Medicaid say what you want say what you want but I needed insurance I needed to go to a doctor people were like you should go to a free clinic I tried to go to a free clinic and the free clinics were like no this is for people who have jobs <laughs> but don't have insurance and I'm like okay I you know all right whatever so I jumped on Medicaid um, Medicaid took about 30 days 30 to 45 days to be approved I, I was approved and from there I got the ball rolling so the first thing they wanted me to do was to go to 
like an OBGYN, get a pregnancy test, well, I get a pregnancy test to, um, so they can refer me to um, get a mammogram. So I went and um, went to the stupid nurse practitioner and did all that and she gave me a referral to get a mammogram. So I went to go get the mammogram and they, and that took like, that appointment took like two weeks, like, you know, two weeks out. And I'm giving you like this time frame because it's, it's crazy. Cancer grows really fast. Cancer cells actually double. So they go from two centimeters to four centimeters to eight to 16. So there's really no time to be like, fooling around so anyways I go to get my mammogram and they're like um, we need a negative pregnancy test I was like uh, okay I'm there's no way that I would be pregnant they're like do you have a cycle I'm like yeah you know and they're like are you on birth control no um, but I'm not doing anything I'm not pregnant they said we still need a negative pregnancy test so then I had to make another appointment with the OBGYN for them to get the pregnancy test and then reschedule the appointment for the mammogram so I did that I went in I got the mammogram let me tell you something I am super sensitive okay at the time I had double D's and everything hurts I don't care I have a very low tolerance for pain so everything hurts they the mammogram they put you know they put your breast in this thing that comes down and squishes your breast like a freaking pancake a pancake <laughs> that don't hurt I don't care what nobody says and right when you're like they can't squeeze it anymore they do one more click click it's like oh heck no this this ain't gonna work this ain't gonna work y'all gonna get one breast you ain't getting the other one this ain't gonna work so uh, <laughs> so boom they were like they looked at the x-rays they were like yeah we see this mass but we don't know we don't know what it is you know it looks like it's cancer but we don't know if it's benign whatever however you say the word if it's um you know bad or good basically if it's sterile not sterile I, I don't know I don't remember the words for it. so they referred me to us a, um, a general surgeon mind you this surgeon is so awesome absolutely love him he's very positive everything was great so anyways I go to him and um, well schedule an appointment go to him so by this time it's probably the end of April maybe yeah the end of April and so he was like, okay, here's the consultation. Um, my mother, my aunt went with me and they're giving me this long, you know, this is what it could be. This is the procedure. This is what we have to do next. So basically my general surgeon said, Hey, we do this right in the house. Um, we, uh, we need a biopsy. I'm like, oh, okay. So anywho, I got the biopsy. It was not painful, thank God. Um, I also want to thank Medicaid because <laughs> Medicaid, everybody downs it because hey, broke folks are on Medicaid or single moms or you know leeches, whatever, whatever. But you know what? When the doctors see Medicaid, they know they're going to get paid. So you get top of the line treatments, top of the line this, top of the line that. I had a nurse practitioner, I had a general surgeon, I had an oncologist, I had nurses. Medicaid was what's up. So anywho, the biopsy. They gave me like the stuff. They, It was like some freezing spray and they sprayed it on the side of my boob. Like I'm talking about you don't feel anything it's like numb fro frozen numb I've never seen or heard about it before but that was awesome so when they stuck the needle in and latched on to the cancer and took a piece off or whatever I didn't really feel it totally awesome so anyways he said that um, they're gonna send it to pathology and to analyze it what it is what kind of cancer it is whatever whatever and schedule another appointment come back so that's what I did 
scheduled another appointment to come back. When I came back, it was May of 2008. So it was the beginning of May, or probably the first week of May. And he was like, you have stage 3B breast cancer. The cancer is, at this point, it's 3 by 3 millimeters. It is very aggressive. Um, and what did he say? He said there's two things that are fed to the cancer to make it grow really fast, which is HERS2, I think H-E-R-S2. It's something that your heart naturally produces. And then also estrogen. My estrogen was making the cancer grow. So I was like, okay, so what's next? And so he was like, okay, um, I'm gonna refer you to an oncologist. He was like, be as though you're 26 and besides the cancer, your body is extremely healthy. We wanna put you on the most aggressive treatment there is. I'm like, okay. He gave me all my options, laid everything out. My mom and my um, my aunt was there, and so was my mom's friend. So I had like little sisterhood teamwork there going on. And um, and yeah, he told me about the natural options, like you know, natural treatments, remedies herbs, diet, you know, that stuff. And then he also talked about radiation, chemotherapy, surgeries and stuff. And um, I went home, I thought it over, I talked with my mom. I was not worried at all. I already knew I wasn't gonna die. Um, I am saved, I am a Christian, I do believe in Jesus. I don't down people for whatever they believe. Um, but my per I mean, I have friends who are, you know, everything. I have atheist friends, I have Catholic friends, Christian friends, friends who, whatever. Um, I don't down other people's religion, and I don't want people to down mine. It's just, mu just mutual respect. We can learn to, to get along regardless. So anyways, you know, I had that type of relationship with God where I already knew I wasn't going to die. I already knew that everything was going to be fine. But I watched everybody else around me kind of panic, you know, like, oh my goodness, you know. But um, I knew that, boom, all this is, is I'm going to have to go through the motions, basically. So I went with um, the options that would put my mother most at ease because I didn't want my mother to stress about it. Um, but I knew it was, hey, it was something that I was gonna have to go through. It, was, it really wasn't a big deal to me. So I chose to go through chemotherapy and to have surgery. So I went to the oncologist. I told him this is, this is what I want. Well, I told my surgeon and oncologist, this is what I want. These are the options that I chose. Um, and the options that I chose was to go through a complete phase of chemotherapy. Not one phase, it was like three different phases of chemotherapy. And um, to have surgery. The surgery I was getting uh, was actually a mastectomy. And I was going to go ahead and do a bilateral mastectomy. Because even though um, I only had cancer in the left breast, I figured, boom. If cancer popped out of nowhere in my left breast, it could probably do the same in my right breast. So I did a bilateral mastectomy, just cut both of them bad puppies off, scrape it, clean it, get it all out, and um, I'll just get some implants, no biggie. So that's what I chose to do. So um, my first surgery was May 12th of 2008, and all it was was putting, um, is, can you see that? A porter cath in. There's my scarring from it. Boom. And what a porter cath is, is basically where I would get my chemo treatment from. It was a, it was, let me see. I don't know how to explain it. It was like, like this. And then there was like a little back to it, like this, and they put it in. And then there was like a catheter that ran like to right next to my heart. So, um, basically, that they would put the needle in my chest every time I was to get chemotherapy. Um, my goodness, I, I probably have some pictures somewhere, so I'll, I'll 
probably post some pictures at the end of this video. They put that in and I was getting my first phase of chemotherapy. Um, whew. That started on June 1st. They had to make sure, you know, the porter cath was fine, working good. They would, you know, pour this little, I don't know what it was, if it was blood thinner or something in there, but it just tasted like like when they put it in your chest you could taste it in your mouth and it tasted like rubbing alcohol and peppermint mixed or something is nasty anyways um so they did that the first phase you know they're they're putting toxic chemicals in your body and um, not only was I getting chemo um, along with the chemo were pills and they will prescribe me pills. Let me tell you something, if you don't have insurance, you're just gonna die because the the pills that I was on cost so much money, like ridiculous amount of money. Like pharmaceutical companies are crooks. We're in the wrong line of business because they have to be billionaires coming up with the prices that they come up with. So I remember um, I had to get one of those big pill organizers because there's certain pills I would have to take the day before, the day of, and the day after chemo. There were certain pills that I had to take like the first three days before chemo. There was like, I, it was just like this whole routine. And the pills that I had to take the day before, the day of, and the day after, those three pills by themselves cost over $400. And I needed to buy those pills every three weeks. So the first phase of chemo I was taking um, was every three weeks. And because they were the most harsh, I remember after my first chemo session, there's one, I have a picture of it also. She called it the tube of love because it was red and she had to sit there and pump it into me. It couldn't go through an IV. She had to pump, the nurse had to pump it to me um, by hand. And the whole time I'm getting it, I had to suck on ice chips just so my mouth, my throat, and my stomach would not get blisters. That's crazy. That is unheard of. They're pumping this crap in me. So anyways, then boom, I'm hooked up to an IV. Of course, before every chemo treatment, they would give me two Benadryls and something else. So those two Benadryls would, I guess, keep me from having some kind of reaction to whatever it was they were giving me so of course i would start dozing off and the chemo session usually lasted around three hours i think it took them about three hours to get it through me my mother took off work every single time to sit with me through chemotherapy which is mad crazy i think i could have done it by myself but hey you know this i'm her firstborn you know she was there i would do the same for my kids but um so after my first treatment they you know the surgeon would always call me how are you doing how are you feeling he said at the third day after getting your chemos when it really really completely hits your body he said i really need you to eat um eating was extremely hard because let me tell you the more seasoning or spices somebody has on food the worse the food tastes when you're going through chemo almost all the food tastes like either metal or grease the more seasonings they had on the food like if you had chicken and all that it tastes like metal nobody wants to sit there and eat metal or eat grease so as soon as I was done getting chemo my mother would race me over to IHOP or wherever and take me out to eat make sure that I stuffed myself and I mean I was like I was more than content to use this opportunity to lose weight because hey I still had on baby fat you know what I'm saying like I had just had my daughter two years prior I didn't lose any of that baby weight and so I was like you know what I don't care if I lose a little weight you know anywho my mother made sure I ate so I ate and um like the whole process I probably lost about 60 pounds I think so it's not too bad after that first set of chemo, I had a surgery. It was November of 2008 when I had my first major surgery. The, like, I was a little scared. I had never, of course, besides getting the portacath put in, this was a major surgery. Like, 
I was like, oh my goodness. So um, I had a lot of people there. A lot of people came. A lot of people supported me. Um, and what the surgery was is the bilateral mastectomy to take, you know, chop my breasts off completely. And then to put um, tissue expanders underneath my chest muscle. And this is just to um, expand it and until I get it to the size that I want for my implants. Some people just boop, just pop implants in and after surgery they're in all this pain and everything. But this is actually the proper way. It's probably the more expensive way, but it's the proper way to slowly stretch your muscles to get it where you want it. Then you take the tissue expanders out and then put your um, implants in. So that's what this surgery was. And I was um, put in the hospital overnight and let me tell you about this experience though it was just like in the movies when you wake up from surgery and everything's all muffled and blurry and I was like oh my goodness this is so cool I was morphined up to the max so I was feeling lovely and um, my family was there my mom you know everybody was there and um, my ex-husband, he even came down. Of course, every surgery, he came down to, you know, pick the kids up and to help. We um, do get along great. We're best friends. You know, just weren't happy together, if that makes sense. So, anywho, um, my, my sibling, my sister, everybody was there. And um, I stayed in overnight and that was the only one of five surgeries that I actually stayed overnight because I convinced my surgeon that hey I'm gonna be supervised I'm staying at my mom's please let me go home I cannot stand being in the hospital I get headaches being in the hospital so anyways that was that surgery and then I started my next phase of chemotherapy and that one was not as harsh let me rewind the first phase of chemo after my first um after I first got it, my body um, kind of rejected it. Um, it was the worst feeling in the world. The worst feeling in the world. They tell me if anything goes wrong, go to the hospital, they'll fix it. You know, they said there's meds to reverse everything. I think the only thing I didn't feel was nausea. Um, and they said like every five years, there's a new combination of chemotherapy. So anything that was given to people for breast cancer two, three years ago is actually considered ancient. So they have made like big come ups and I was um, in, a, no. I was in um, my oncologist office is the in the top 10 in the nation. Um, for research something something so anyways I knew I was in good hands anywho um, when I got that first session mm -mm, my I felt like a ton of bricks were on my chest like it was like hard to breathe so I'm laying there in bed like oh my goodness and um but then my heart was like racing I'm laying down why is my heart racing when I'm laying down my chest was hurting um, and my gas so basically they say my gastro system or whatever it was shutting down um, chemo is designed to kill all fast-growing cells which include like hair nails that's why a lot of people's hair fall out when they get go through chemo not all chemo treatments make your hair fall out but some of them do so you know your nails your hair and kind of like how you know your some of your digestive system so basically they had to try to reverse that of course my heart was pounding because they had to make my heart not produce so much of something hers too that was making the cancer grow and then of course estrogen so they put me in a medical menopause I was 26, 27 now, in menopause. Cray cray. So, anywho, the positive on the positive note, I didn't have to shave. I wasn't growing hair anywhere. Totally awesome. And I wasn't having a period. Boom. In Eve's face. Because me and Eve are going to have a chat when I die. Because, mm mm. So anywho, um, 
So second phase wasn't so bad. I don't remember too much of the side effects I had. Um, I know that the and then the third phase of chemo um, was supposed to be the lightest. I was getting it every week, like whatever they put in it. But this one made my fingertips hurt. I remember that, like under like this whole thing, it it it, it was it was really hurting and. Um, I struggle and and you will be surprised how much you take your fingertips for granted it's like everything you do is your fingertips like I had a two-year-old daughter who whose hair needed to be done it hurt I fought through the pain to do my daughter's hair because I will not have my daughter running around looking busted you know that's that's the mother in me I, I just can't do it um, putting your hands in your pockets my goodness it hurt putting your shoes on because you have to put your finger in the back of the shoe tying your shoes I mean washing the dishes like everything hurt my fingertips like the things you the things you just you take for granted is it's mad crazy so anywho um, my second surgery was to get the um, what is it called tissue expanders um, adjusted because uh, it did not I guess the way they sat it in there, it, the magnet that was in there wasn't right. Because what happens is the tissue expanders, they put it under your chest muscles, but there's like this um, little, uh, little metal piece, little magnetic piece. So they have like, they'll have like a thingy, a syringe, and they'll put it in and um, fill it up with saline, salt water. Um, but they have to find the magnets like the magnet has to come up front and they use the thing and it goes in the, like a specific you know specific hole well it wasn't doing that it wasn't doing it properly so this my second surgery was to get that fixed so they fixed that and before surgery I was a double D and as they were filling it I came to a full C cup and was like stop this is this is what I want I just want to see cup I and, and the doctors he was a little baffled like what he was like you don't want double D's you don't want what you had da, da, da. I'm like uh no I plan to lose weight <laughs> and I would like my body to be symmetrical and plus all the best bras and bikinis are in B's and C's so let me get a full C cup and I'm good so that was that my third surgery was getting the I had five surgeries I think I'm mixing one no that was the fourth fourth surgery was to get the tissue expanders out and to have the implants put in um, so he was asking me if I wanted the salt water the saline implants or the um, what is it silicone and you know he told me the difference the saline at any point I can add to it I can take from it and it's very simple procedure because all they have to do is um, insert it through the bag and if anything happened with the bag it's only salt water it'll go into your body you'll be fine but again it's salt water so it doesn't feel like the natural breast it doesn't feel you know have that kind of breast feel to it with silicone it already comes pre-packaged it's not open you can't add to it you can't take from it the only way you can get a bigger size or a smaller size is to have the complete surgery take them out and put the new ones in so what I, I chose the silicone because the silicone feels exactly like the breast like everybody always asks me hey oh, what does it feel like what it? you know so everybody wants to touch my breast I'm not saying everybody but like family close friends like oh you got silicone I never seen that can I touch it can I feel it so it's like I am in a sideshow boom gotta pop the boobs out everybody's you know filling the silicone it feels natural if I didn't tell anybody they would never even know um and I really don't ever even wear bras because boom they sit there like the only time I wear bras is if I want like a more of a symmetrical shape um, because what happened was when they put the implants in on the left side is where I had the infected breast the one that had the cancer in it so that one they had to take more skin like they they had to cut more so the boobs aren't exactly symmetrical um, due to that 
So if I want a, like a perfect symmetrical shape, I put a bra on. Other than that, I almost never wear a bra. I just put my shirt on. Um, and then you have to have your implants for a whole year before they put the nipples on because, you know, um, they said your breasts kind of drop a little and, and settle into place. And if they put the nipples on before your breast settles, your nipples are going to be sitting on top of your breast. Hmm. So anywho, I'm like, man, this is cool. I have no nipples. Boom, I got titties that are sitting perfect. I don't have to wear a bra. Technically, I could have wore a see-through shirt and nobody would know nothing. Anywho, I don't. I'm very cons I'm conservative in my dress, but just saying. So anywho, my fifth and last surgery was January of 2010, and it was to get the port calf taken out. Um, my surgeon, um, so after I got the port calf out, my surgeon saw that I had a bad scar on there, and he was very disappointed about the scar, and he was like, I can close it up, make it smaller, let me cut out the um, scar tissue and all this. I was like, nope, no, 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 I'm not that kind of girl. I'm not like that super prissy, pretty kind of chick. I don't care about scars. Leave it. I'm good with it. So anywho, that was January of 2010. I started college like again for like the third, fourth time. I'm like a professional student. A week after that, um, um, I stopped getting chemo. They put me on what's called tamoxifen, which is like some hormone uh, treatment and it's supposed to increase my survival rate. Um, number one, they wanted to take my ovaries because breast cancer is related to ovarian cancer, but I knew in my mind, I still want more kids. You're not taking my ovaries. So I actually fought to keep my ovaries, so I have them. Thank God. I have a beautiful one-year-old daughter now with my husband, so I'm glad I kept them. And we are actually currently trying for a set of twin boys. No, I'm not taking medication for it. I'm not, you know, not doing anything, just having it natural and praying about it. We're gonna, I gotta give my husband some sons, you know, some two boys, um, because my 13 year old son and my 10 year old daughter are from previous marriages. So, um, anyways, I fought to keep my ovaries, so I have those still. And, um, Let's see, I've been cancer free for five years, going on six years. So they told us most people who do get the cancer back, it only reoccurs within the first five years. So basically I'm in the clear. I've been cancer free. Um, technically I still have, you know, one or two corrective surgeries. Um, but be as though I'm not on Medicaid anymore, <laughs> um, I have to find an insurance that will pay for all that. But um, in the regular, my regular bill, I would get a bill in the mail for all my medical treatments and everything throughout breast cancer. And of course, my Medicaid covered it 100%. But looking at the bill, I can understand why people sell their homes, why people just go broke and people just die. The pills by themselves cost way too much money. And um, my treatments were actually anywhere from $2,000 to $15,000 a month. I'm to per month. That's a lot of money. So, um, yeah, that's what I was dealing with. So, whenever there's, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month and stuff like that, um, everybody you know hey gives me a shout out my real name is sarah so everybody's like yeah i want to give a shout out to you know this a lot of people actually were there through my journey a lot of people were praying for me people i didn't even know and people who really cared about me it, it was mad crazy i can't say that i went through this alone because i didn't um a lot a lot a lot of people helped me i had my aunt and uncle in atlanta who picked my kids up and kept my kids for a while sometimes um my ex-husband he was actually there for me he would pick the kids up and and he would be there for them. so um also yeah my ex-husband was there picked the kids up was there for the kids he came to visit the kids anyways but um he did schedule a lot of his travel time around the time i would have surgeries of course my mother was there 
my mother was beyond awesome. She went to every appointment, you know, all of my chemo treatments. Um, my friend Bran, shout out. Um, he was also there for me, prayed. He, um, he actually walked. Let me tell you, he's probably gonna get mad because I told y'all this. At the time, I lived in Warner Robins, Georgia. He lived in Macon, Georgia. Macon, Warner Robins is probably about 30 minute drive, okay? It's the next city over, but it, it's a good drive, you know? So I told him, hey, you know, my surgery, my first major surgery in November was um, at six in the morning. He was like, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Do you know this man walked? This man walked 30 mile, 30 plus miles to be there. He left, he said, I think around two in the morning or something. He walked all the way there and he got there at like 5.50 a.m. He was there through the surgery. When I woke up, he was there. And you know, I didn't know he actually walked. This is a friend walking to the hospital. Would you walk to the next city over? I wouldn't. This man walked, and then after surgery, after he knew everything was okay, he knew I wasn't hungry and all this stuff, he, you know, he left me a little snack, um, but, um, and then he walked back. I didn't know this until his mother called my room. His mother called my room, I'm like, hello. I was like, the morphine is winding down a little bit. I was more coherent. His mother was like, did he get a ride back? I was like, also, um, who else? Um, there was so many family. My, my mom's boss, some of her people, prayer lists, um, my whole family, my ex-husband's whole family. I know they were praying for me as well. Um, just everybody. And also, I would like, and my siblings, um, you know, even though all of them worked and everything, when they could help, they were there, you know, helping with the kids, helping with me. Um, so they were there. But I would like to give a special shout out to um, my baby, Nasir Hunt, my oldest son. At the time, he was only five years old and he had to grow up real fast. Um, he, I had to teach him, you know, my phone number, I had to teach him the address, I had to teach him, you know, if anything happens to call 911, like if mommy falls, if mommy doesn't wake up, you know, to have to sit down and explain this to your five-year-old, you know, mommy is very sick, um, and for him to see, you know, all my hair fall out, and of course I had my daughter who's two years old. So whenever my siblings were at work and stuff and he was there and I was too fatigued and too weak to even get out of bed. Like there were days I couldn't even feed myself. Like I was down for the count. He would wake up, he would, um, he would wash up, he would get his two year old sister in the tub wash her up, he would fix his self breakfast, he would fix her breakfast, he would play with her, um, he would fix her lunch, he would fix his lunch. He was doing all of this. Sometimes even like taking out the trash in the house. It's like he had to go from, you know, being a five year old child. I mean, he was, this was it, like the bulk of it happened over the summer, but this is a kindergartner you know, that had to all of a sudden grow up and do all these things. And, um, yeah, so he did really, really, really good. And he had to become, it's like he went from being a child to being a man, you know, grown, he had to do things that grown ups do. Um, I feel bad for that. He shouldn't have, no, no kid should ever have to see their mother go through that ever but um he did really great and so i want to give a special shout out come say hi nas he's behind the camera he's 13 now so he's he's a grown-up and he's eating cereal so he's munching <laughs> this is my baby all right you did awesome
Thank All you. right, so that concludes my breast cancer video. So if anybody has any questions about it, um, leave them in the comment section. I will answer all of them to the best of my ability. And um, subscribe, man. Subscribe to me. Holla. Thank you.